Wonderful. Thanks for the nice introduction. And a pleasure to see you again here um, on stage. As just mentioned, and uh, ah, awesome. I'm going to have a little bit of a look into global AI echoes, so what has been happening around the world, and uh, that in some numbers. There are a bunch of surveys. We run a survey usually every year. We decided that that's not fast enough, so we run it every three months by now to kind of stay on top and stay at the pace uh, the topic is moving. And I brought some numbers with it to really have a look into um, what we have achieved, uh, how it looks right now, and what maybe we have missed or might miss. So without further ado, um, that one slide doesn't really fit the rest of the presentation, um, th but it's still something that, that struck me as, as pretty impressive. For years, the community has been working on making AI more explainable because the whole back push was, hey, um, this is a complex model, I don't understand it, so I can't use it. So there was a huge effort into making them more transparent, um, more understandable, all these kind of things, which I think was a great effort and had certainly uh, quite some good impact in moving forward, but nothing really magical happened out of this. And then overnight, um, there was one system which made AI incredibly tangible and suddenly a flurry of activities started. Um, and you know what I'm talking about? That's Christmas about one and a half years ago. And what I think is striking is that that model is still, despite being your models available by now, one of the most intransparent that there ever has been. So it turns out that as soon as people kind of get a feeling for how to use it and what it can do, all the transparency, I don't want to say is out the window, but apparently become quite a lot less relevant. Um, so all of this basically brought us here, and that's just a, a slide that's basically out of date by definition, but obviously you know there's a lot of stuff going on in the media um, that's hard to keep up with. Looking a little bit deeper, um, and that's from, the, uh, from Stanford, from the state of AI, uh, different topics that AI researchers working on, and that used to be human only. So I just put AI in one corner, a human intelligence in the other one, and just quick feeling of what you see there, uh, what's basically where the AI would win and where the human would win, and I'm, I'm afraid we are on the retreat here, um, which is obviously an achievement on the side of AI, but also typically begs many questions as to, okay, what is the human then gonna do, right? Most of the time, the answer is typically collaboration and it's not that easy. Looking a little bit different in terms of achievements, and obviously that's a very, very small selection, right? There's tons of things going on. Um, one thing that has been released I don't know, over the weekend last week was AlphaFold, uh, the third version, um, which I think is pretty impressive because it's, uh, it's slightly different from all the other uh, typical media things where you have voice bots and chatbots and whatnot, which are all very tangible and very interesting. But that one um, actually helps directly in the pharma industry, um, medical health and so on, uh, moving things forward that also, just like Go or chess, previously were thought to be unsolvable uh, with a machine. And now, you know, it's it's job pushing certain fields uh, forward quickly. Fahren, wo diejenigen heute einzahlen, genau das, was heute ausgezahlt wird. That's <laughs> erschreckend. Um, the other topics, oh, that was Christian Lindner, actually. Um, so the other topics on here, uh, bottom left, uh, might not be the most intuitive picture, but that's one of the famous leaderboards in terms of models competing with each other. And the one that's marked is the Lama model, um, which is almost on the same score as the top private models. So for quite a while, the, um, the statement was the private models, so owned by companies, built by companies, not really available except for an API, are the ones which are really leading in the market. But then the open source community, so to speak, with some support in this case, obviously from Meta, um, picked up and pushed forward and the open source models are now playing in the top tier as well, which I think personally will further accelerate because there are just many more people in the open source community than within private companies. Um, other things, obviously, in the UAI Act, I'm not going to say too much about this, but it is an achievement. Many on the rest of the world were discussing here, there was a lot of skepticism, but we have it, and it turns out it might not be perfect, but uh, it's better to have it than not to have it. Um, down there, uh, a new chip, you know, NVIDIA is crunching them out uh, by the months in new versions, kind of. Uh, again, quite a lot of capacity um, 
available for this kind of technology. And then more on the European side, I mean, the EU AI Act obviously as well, um, two startups which are usually in the news, Mistral, you will all have heard of, I Love Alpha, you will all have heard of, um, which are the two significant players um, regarding uh, language models and generative AI from Europe, built here, designed here, and run here. Then we just had the mention Sepp Hochreiter. I just put him there as an example. And I've heard it before uh, from Peter and, and others in the panel as well. A lot of the research is actually coming from Europe. Um, obviously not all of it, but we're quite good at this. And there are certain achievements. Let's see how the uh, X LSTMs are going to do. Not that easy to pronounce, uh, but good, good, uh, interesting um, train of thought here. And finally, um, that's a guy you just heard uh, speaking between Chris and Lindner uh, a few weeks ago, I believe, on the OMR stage. Uh, one of our top politicians obviously going out there and saying, we cannot miss the whole AI thing, as we have missed so many others in Germany. So I was quite happy to hear that there is somebody going on a big stage basically just saying this. There obviously was not directly an approach on how to, but awareness is a, is a good first step. And when you look, and these are obviously um, uh, mostly US folks, on how much relevance the whole topic will have, I was quite surprised by these statements, which are basically all say, um, e e we're all talking about quite a bit of hype on AI, but if you listen to these people, they say, well, that's not enough yet. So there's more to come. Some say, okay, maybe now it's a little bit overhyped, but in the long term it's underhyped. Eric Schmidt just said this stuff is underhyped. Um, you know, there might be personal agenda still. Um, Andy, a CEO of Amazon, uh, said recently, you know, if there's some big bet I would go with right now, then it's actually Gen AI. So again, three, which basically um, all fit on this topic, which leaves us basically with this. Um, it's a topic that we really should pick up on and push forward if we do this here, which I think is great, uh, because otherwise we're going to be left in the dust to the numbers. When you look at, um, and in this case it's from Torchos Media, the AI index, and it's a ranking, but the order on the left is not the correct one. It's just that I wanted to highlight Germany here. Um, they look at three different, three different levels. One is implementation, um, another one is innovation, and a third one is investment. And you can see in implementation, you know, it's about talent, it's about um, operations, it's about infrastructure, innovation is about research and development, and investment is uh, pretty much about commercialization and government strategy. We're number two in this ranking regarding government strategy, which I believe is mostly due to the EU AI Act. And overall, we're not too bad, right? If we look at operational excellence, number 13, the US is at number 28. So while they are leading overall, and China being second, um, the numbers don't look that bad for Germany. What's interesting, I believe, is how it changed over the last uh, two years, I believe. So these are numbers from 2023, and the one before was from 2021. We went up on almost all of the topics, except for two, which is research. We went down, we went from six to two, uh, sorry, from six to eight, um, where I don't have an explanation for yet, uh, but it sounds like research is lacking a bit, probably talent moving overseas. And what's painful discovery was that the commercialization actually went down when everybody's saying that that should go up. So let me just highlight this. This went down from, we have been on number eight, now we're on number 11. And the absolute numbers were actually going up, which means we're just being too slow. Coming back to Fabian's words from earlier, um, a bit of speed wouldn't be a bad idea. Another one, if you look at R&D spent from the top three companies average, these are striking numbers. That's 31 billion euro per year from the top three US companies, 12 billion in China, and 11 billion in Germany. Now, 11 to 12 is not so, so much of a difference, but if you just quickly consider how much you get for a billion in Germany and how much you get for a billion in China, uh, there might be quite a gap again. The other striking part here, I believe, is if you look at which these top three companies are, you will see on the top six software companies and on the bottom three automotive companies. That might be an issue. And if you sort them, 
and the list is top 10. I shorten it to six. On the bottom um, is no other German company. Um, there's Hosch in there, which at least is European. But you can see again um, the top four are actually from the US, so Apple didn't make it in the top three. Um, and then there's Huawei from China. And while Volkswagen is constantly spending a lot on R&D, they're half of what Alphabet is spending on it. And Alphabet is just one of the companies doing R&D. And I've heard this before. Uh, today, there's quite a lot uh, that we probably need to catch up with. And it kind of highlights this problem with the commercialization, um, because obviously these are commercial companies. A question from the state of fire that we ran. How threatened do executives or decision makers feel in Germany in this case by regarding the business model um, by generative AI? And what you can see, what is quite striking, if you add the none and the little up, that's 50%. 50% of the surveyed people, um, so all business leaders, basically said, I don't see any threat. That was end of last year. We were in Germany leading with being you know, relaxed about it. 36 was the global average. So globally, the average, about roughly 3,000 people said, you know, one third was relaxed about the topic of AI regarding the business model. Moving three months ahead, the global number hardly changed, but Germans got a little bit more realistic about it, which I think is good news. So there's a lot more attention, uh, quite apparently, on that topic uh, being somewhat threatening to more business models than previously thought. Also, the extreme threat from 1% is gone, but I mean, 1%, um, fair enough. If you look at what's being expected, it's quite stunning that no matter how you cut the data set, if it's global, if it's Germany, if it's the financial services industry, it's always roughly 90% who expect a significant increase in their productivity, a significant impact on the productivity. And same cuts, roughly 80% uh, expect substantial transformation within the next three years. The question for me always a little bit, there's at least 10% that want to have quite a lot of productivity increase but don't want to change. I'm really curious to see how that will work. Um, but again, huge expectations uh, about many changes coming up. When we use about which topic, the expectation is that there will be an impact. And you see the slightly shaded bars um, are again from end of last year. The ones you can see a little bit better uh, from the first quarter of this, of this year. So improving efficiency and productivity went from 63% being by far the most important topic for Germany. Again, globally, that was also leading, but about 10 percentage point less. Went down to just about 50%. Um, same with reducing costs, went down just a little bit. Um, the topic of encouraging innovation growth uh, is roughly the same as before. And you see on the bottom end, there are another 10 that I did list here, uh, which are all somewhere in the, in the 20s. Um, interestingly, I think is that fraud and risk went up from about 10, 15% to nearly 30%. So using Gen AI for these topics, uh, apparently folks have discovered that there's a lot that they can do. While at the same point, as surprising to me, using it in software development to accelerate it went down quite a bit from you know 25% to 18 or something. Um, but still, it's basically the same message that companies tend to focus on rather technical topics at the moment, right? short-term cost and efficiency improvements. And while it has gotten better, strategic and long-term bets that might be a little bit harder to develop um, are still kind of on the hindsight. Seeing all of this, um, the big question is usually is, what's the problem? What's holding us back? And what you can see here is really, um, again, the percentage numbers from now. Outstanding globally and in Germany is talent, right? Skilled employees. If it's the people that develop it, the people that use it, doesn't matter. There needs to be a better understanding, more people that can actually handle AI. Um, at the same point, there's quite a bit of employee resistance, and these are again German numbers, of pushing uh, the usage and the implementation of AI back. So two culture topics in one way or the other. Then there's another bunch uh, regarding risks, governance, regulatory topics, and so on, which are reasonably high. And lastly, um, topics more about implementation. The gray dots are, again, the ones from end of last year. Skill shortages and talent issues have apparently gone down quite a bit, from 41% to 35 36 now. Um, kind of aligns with the rest. Lots of the part in the middle has gone up. To me, the story I see here is that people have understood more and have realized that there are more challenges than they expected to be. 
and use cases was the most surprising to me. Everybody was like, oh, that's easy. That's 15%. Like Germans were absolutely convinced that they know what the use cases are. We were the best in this globally. Three months later, it turns out maybe not. Maybe, maybe that's actually trickier than we thought. Um, brings us basically to three topics of what to do, right? Obviously, invest in people. Make sure you get this governance set up right. Don't hunt a single use case. Um, and lastly, this whole idea of experimenting strategically, having a beginner's mindset, is something that, that should be encouraged. And we see successful companies do. And that brings a whole list of subtopics with it. I'm not going to go through those, um, but I think the most important ones uh, and not having it siloed into one particular uh, part of a company is quite important. Thinking about not just a single use case, but a little bit bigger, call it target operating model, call it transformation, something. Um, and lastly, what's probably the most simple statement and the most important one at the same point is don't wait. We've had so many companies, uh, so many uh, C-levels that told me like, okay, so it's not really completely finished yet, this Gen AI stuff or this AI stuff. When should I start? Well, you know, if you want to be around in two years, you better start now, um, even if it's not finished, because it's mature enough. And even if what you do right now doesn't work out in the end, you will learn a lot. Um, the other question was about talent. And again, end of last year, what was quite stunning is that Germany was leading in terms of saying talent is our main issue. And the gray bars were what Germany was doing in terms of Germany, that we were pretty much on the last position. So that's uh, somebody saying like, we really have a big problem here, but we're not gonna do anything about it. And I was really surprised. I have the numbers for like, you know, 10 days or something. I was really surprised. Globally, everything went to, you know, 30 to 40%, all average 36%. I made the calculation five times. It has actually the same for all of three. Um, and for Germany, look at that. I mean, apart from educating workforce, you know, where we are not so, f I mean, it's about, what, seven percentage points, it's not too bad. The other two, we're kind of overshooting, right? A at least if you compare to global averages. So apparently recruiting, um, that's something that many people really took to heart. So if you're looking for a job, might be a good opportunity. Not that that was bad before. Um, and in terms of reskilling workers, that's, a, that's like a 14% plus. That's a lot. So there's a lot of education and training apparently going on right now, or at least being planned. The other one, is about adoption, which the most simple way to adopt, I believe, is introducing some simple Gen AI tool, you know, white label, bar, Gemini, ChatGPT, whatever, uh, into your company so your employees can actually work and play with it. And these are the now global numbers. German numbers look roughly the same. And you can see 25% of the companies say that less than 20% of the employees have access to such tools, right? Then you have and it's luckily quarters, roughly 50% that say up to 40% have access to these tools and so on. And on the top, um, there are only 16% of companies where 80 or more employees, 80% or more employees have access to these tools. That looks great, right? Except that's the top 5%. Other side, which is now the bottom 65, so I kind of cut out the middle part, looks like this. 55% of companies say that no more than 20% of the employees have access to a simple tool of whatever form. That's not how adoption looks like when you ask me. And that's really, really easy to fix. Um, so I hope this will change uh, in the next story, which is basically running right now. So what we can see is the future is here. Uh, it's just not very evenly distributed, which brings me to one other point. If we look at this from a social perspective, and that was a stunning question to me. Um, and I hope the graph gets it across because it took me a while to put these numbers in some image. We asked the same people again, and these are, um, well, you can see, you know, global numbers, Europe, uh, Germany, and so on, uh, end of last year again. Will Gen AI rather lead to a further centralization of power or to a further decentralization of power? The blue ones, are all the people that said it will rather lead to a centralization of power and the green ones rather to a distribution of power. You can see a vast majority believes that this will lead to a centralization of power, which I believe is a rather negative view for most, um, you know, unless you're one of those few 
<laughs> which, which actually get that power then. And very few, I mean, still more than 30%, but comparatively few think that is going to lead to a decentralization of power. So democratization, if you like. And the interesting part is the UK is the one where least people think it's centralization and most people think it's decentralization. And still, it's more uh, tilted towards centralization. That's a bit scary to me, to be honest. So um, I think that's something also to be kind of kept in sight when we discuss this topic to make sure this whole thing doesn't go the wrong way. Because there's a lot of trust questions around it. There have always been trust questions. Usually they were about, can I trust the model? Now it seems to shift more to, can I trust the companies that use those models? Right? There seems to be this shift. There's just been recently, I'm pretty sure most of you have seen this, um, Stack Overflow providing their data. And while in the terms and conditions, it said that if you provide an answer to Stack Overflow, it's theirs. People, when they signed, you know, with a typical click this one button thing, uh, this agreement, didn't consider that their answers would be used into one large model that's, you know, being uh, commercialized in some other way. And now they are trying to basically, some of them, trying to basically take down their answers because they don't like their answers to be included in one of these models and are being blocked from doing this. So there's quite an interesting fight going on. Um, now you can say, well, they signed this, but then again, you know, how many terms and conditions of 40 pages do you click OK on every day? So it's a bit of a tricky situation. So uh, social topics are quite, quite challenging and, and quite interesting. And I think here it's also, to me, pretty obvious that um, maybe we should not get everything from outside of our European borders at least, but make sure that um, if we care about this from a societal point, uh, make sure that we also support the people that we have here to make sure that you know we can actually have a say in this. And lastly, um, missed opportunities is really, really hard to put down because they're, it's very unclear and very many at the same time. I discussed with uh, my global counterparts and what they believe are the missed opportunities. One is there's a lot going into right now and it's understandable from a business point of view in terms of using this for marketing, you know, selling more kind of things. There's not so much on actual society problems like using it for climate change or against rather um, seeing if we can do something about poverty or, or health. They do progress, but a lot less than they might be. Fair enough, these might also be slightly more challenging. At the same point, what we see certainly in Germany in, in many discussions is that companies tend to do small things and reasonably slow. There are not too many companies that say, let's do this quickly. And it's funny enough, if I speak to German companies headquartered here in Germany, but have subsidiaries in you know, the US and wherever, they say, our US colleagues um, are doing a lot more than we here, because we have to prove so many things up front um, that the investment is worth it, while the US colleagues can just get the money and start with it. So there's a lot on, on the culture side, I believe, in the, in the, that we are too slow. And Fabian mentioned this at the beginning, there's a dire need for speed. Um, and the other one is a small part. There's really lots of, I wouldn't say tiny, but rather small use cases being discussed. There are not so many moonshots. And Peter said this before as well. Um, we certainly lack a number of moonshots. And that's, it, it's funny. I talk to my colleagues globally and they say, hey, Germany, you're not really a bad position. Why are you not doing any moonshots? And the example, which doesn't work for this topic so nicely, but makes sense a lot, is like, we would have expected self-driving cars being pushed out of Germany. Why didn't that happen? And we had one of the first in the 80s, right? But that kind of then went in the shelf. Um, and now there are opportunities to do these moonshots. It seems we have to get our act together. And it doesn't matter if I talk globally or in Europe. Uh, what I basically hear a lot is like, Germany, please get your act together. Because for Europe, we're looking on you. So that's quite some responsibility. And I think it's not too hard to get there. And certainly it will be beneficial. So, final word, uh, more moonshots, it's really hard to shrink your way to success, only, you know, cut costs and optimize these things. Final word, number of employees from the survey is supposed to go up. So, some good news here. Thank you so much. <laughs>